All right, today we're going to be in Galatians chapter 6, so I hope you're there, or can get there fairly quickly there. Galatians chapter 6, we're going to come to the final part of this great letter from Paul to the churches in Galatia. He is, he's poured out his heart, and, and I hope that you have been able to, to feel that even as we've gone through this. Uh, it, he's poured out his heart, just defending the true gospel of grace in Christ Jesus. It means everything to him. He's, he's shown us consistently that works cannot earn salvation. That is a work of God on our behalf because we're too sinful to accomplish it on our own. The works we do as believers are works that reveal a changed heart. One, one of love for God and other people. They don't earn us God's favor. And, and he's been very consistent in that throughout this. Uh, but they are a response to the favor He's already shown us. Today, He looks at you, if you're in Christ, and He looks at you as one who is highly favored by Him. He has made that choice to favor you through Jesus Christ. Um, it's not something we could earn. It's not something we could do on our own. So as we come to chapter 6, we find three more impacts the true gospel should have on our lives. There's just three more impacts, and these we're going to wrap up uh, this series today. First of all, and I'm, I'm not going to read all the verses at one time, I'm going to take them one point at a time. The true gospel leads us to lift one another up. Leads us to lift one another up. Look at the first six verses. Let's follow along with me as I read. Brethren, if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, and that's a key phrase right there, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But each one must examine his own work, and then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone and not in regard to another. For each one will bear his own load. The one who is taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. Going back to verse 1, he says, brethren, this means he's addressing believers. And in context, he says, you who are spiritual. And that's an important phrase. He's talking to those who are the spirit-minded believers, not the ones who are starting to listen to the Judaizers, not the ones who are starting to stray away from the truth a little bit or think about or ponder it. He's like, those of you who are walking firmly in the Spirit of God, I'm speaking to you, and here's what I'm telling you to do. I want you to help restore those who are not walking like you. To look out for your brothers and sisters who are in Christ, but who are kind of wavering, who are kind of getting on that fence. The Judaizers are starting to pull them back to that ceremonial, ritualistic law, and they're starting to contemplate that. I need you to reach out and I need you to pull them back. I'm not there. I'm just writing you a letter, Paul's saying. I need you to reach out and restore them and pull them back. Now, the word restore in the Greek is, is also used at times to describe three other things, scripturally speaking. Those three things, keep these in your head as I talk now. Setting bones, mending nets, and bringing divided people back together. That's the primary way, the third one he's using it, but I want to talk about all three of those aspects of this word for a moment, okay? I want to apply those three things, and when we do, we'll discover things about the true gospel. He said it was, we said it was for setting bones, used for setting bones. Well, the true gospel turns us into people who gently seek to bring healing to our fellow believers, not more hurt. Amen? We are about, we are about setting those bones, mending those wounds, helping people who have been hurt and wounded, even in the church, by restoring them, coming alongside them, and helping them find love and healing rather than judgment and pain. We should be a people that, and, and we are here at Bolivia Baptist, praise God, where, where we can't contain our love for one another and our fellowship for one another. I mean, we're, we're together. When we get together, we're clearly loving each other. We're clearly in fellowship. I wish more churches were like that. Amen? We have to recognize that when we come in, we bring all our hurts and we bring all our pains, we bring our disappointments and God sometimes with us. And we have to help one another through that. 
We have to help bring healing for each other. But that word's also used in the mending of nets. The true gospel turns us into people who gently seek to repair fellow believers by revealing areas of weakness and strengthening each other, by, by helping each other through the temptations of life. I mean, w when we know, get to know somebody really, really well in the, in, in the fellowship of the believers, we begin to see not just their strengths but their weaknesses. Not just the positives but the negatives. And God shows us that so that we can come alongside each other and say, hey, you see mine and I see yours, so let's work together to help each other grow. Let's, let's help each other. Let's, let's mend each other. Let's take those, those broken areas of our lives and help make them whole. Let's, let's mend each other. You know, you got to give permission, but that's what we call accountability. We allow someone to come alongside us and we give them permission to tell us when they see us walking in a way we should not walk and to help us come back, to help correct us. And we need that in the body of believers. We need to do that for one another. Then, then the third thing we said it was for is the thing that I think is primarily used here, and that's bringing divided people back together. The true gospel turns us into people who refuse absolutely refuse to be divided from one another from one another so that we can actively go after straying sheep we refuse to to let somebody just walk away without going after them doesn't mean they're always going to come back doesn't mean they're always going to come home but we love them enough to make an effort we love them enough to make an effort Believers who have been freed from the penalty of sin still sin, still struggle with the consequences of their sin in this life. We talked about that in Sunday school this morning. God says many, many times, if you will walk in this way, I will do this, I will bless you in these ways. How many blessings do we rob ourselves of when we fail to listen to and obey God? But sin, that sin leads to brokenness, weakness, and separation from fellow believers. Let's talk, let's talk about evangelism for just a second. God's just leaving me to talk about it for just a moment. All right? I'm not the only one here called to do that. Y'all understand that, right? Okay? We talk about how we want to see people get saved and we want to see people come to church, but are we doing evangelism? Are we telling people about Jesus? The Lord says, if you will tell people about Jesus, I will add to your number. If our number's not being added to, then what's that evidence of? that we're giving lip service to something that we're not necessarily doing. I'm not saying that, to, I mean, there's some here that are doing it. I know that. I'm just saying we need to think about these things in that way. And what does that lead to? It leads to brokenness, weakness in the church, separation from fellow believers who start to wander off. And we have to look at that, and we have to think about that. We, as the spirit-minded, need to gently restore and lift up believers who have quenched the spirit and allowed themselves to be worldly-minded again. Look around. Think about people who are no longer here. Go get them. Don't wait on me to do it. Trust me, I've been trying. But it takes more than one. It takes the church as a whole. Go get them. Tell them you love them. Restore them. Tell them it's okay. They can come back. And they don't have to be embarrassed because that's not the kind of church we are. Verse 2, he says, uh, I'm sorry, back to verse 1. Restore such a one in a gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Be careful when you go to those people. Don't be pulled away yourself. And he says, bear one another's burdens and therefore fulfill the law of Christ. Walk with them. Help them carry whatever weight they're carrying. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But each one must examine his own work and then he will, will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone and not in regard to, to another. Paul cautions the spirit-minded to be aware of their own sin and their own need for grace. Um, we cannot lift others up from a position of arrogance. We cannot go to them and say, hey, you know, you're this and you need to be this like me. No, that, that's not going to work. That will never work. It may sound okay, but it's not. 
We, we can't bring people back. We cannot lift others up from a position of arrogance. It has to still be from a position of empathy. I understand where you are, brother. I, I won't stop going myself or, or whatever. I, I've been where you are. I've been discouraged about the church or I've been pulled away by the things from my past and away from God. But I want to tell you that's not where I realized I needed to be and it's not where you need to be. Will you let me walk you back? Will you let me walk with you back? That's empathy. That's not arrogance. So by being gracious to our fellow believers, we help them see how to be gracious to us when we fail and need uplifting. We should be gracious to one another. Amen? Because the moment I stop being gracious to you is the moment I'm probably going to need it and you're going to be hesitant to give it to me because of what I did. You see what I'm saying? Empathy and grace breathe empathy and grace in others. Verse 5. For each one will bear his own load. Wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What did you say back here in verse 2, Paul? Bear one another's burdens. And then over here in verse 5 you say, For each one will bear his own load. Paul, which is it? This does not contradict that. I think it connects to verse 4. But each one must examine his own work, and they will have reason for boasting in regard to himself and not in regard to another, for each one will bear his own load. Meaning we all bear the same burden of the struggle with sin. We are all personally responsible. Let me explain what I mean by that. I can uplift you, and you can help uplift me. But I don't take responsibility for you, nor do you take responsibility for me before God. You can help lift me up out of the pit of sin if I get into it, but the consequences don't fall on you then. They still fall on me. Okay? So there's a difference. There's one burden you can help me bear, and that's the burden of being under the weight of that and needing to get out from under it. You can help lift me up out of that. But the burden you cannot bear that I have to bear alone is the consequences, what it costs me for my sin. Praise God, Jesus bore that eternally for me. Amen? My load is my load. You can help restore me, but it's still my load. Verse 6. The one who has taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. This seems out of step with the previous verses, but it's not. Restoration is not just about empathy. It is also about education. Believers are called to teach each other as part of God's sanctifying work in his church. We, we lift somebody up. We're supposed to help restore them. We're supposed to examine ourselves. We're to help, bear, help them bear the load, lift them up out of it, and then teach good things to replace those bad things that we sometimes step into. To teach each other is part of God's sanctifying work. We can restore someone without helping teach them how to make... We cannot restore someone without helping teach them how to make better choices in the future. So the true gospel leads us to lift one another up out of the pit of sin and teach each other how to better walk in Christ and His grace. I've heard it said, encouragement's like peanut butter. The more you spread it around, the more things stick together. We're called to encourage others to walk more closely to Christ so they can walk in unity with His church. The work of the one who is spirit-minded is to teach the unspiritual how to return to being spirit-minded and get back in step with Christ's church. Secondly, this morning, the true gospel leads us to become spiritual people. Now, he's talking about spirit-minded people, but, but he gets to verses 7 through 8, and he says this, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Simply put, these verses reiterate what Paul said in chapter 5 about the deeds of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. As with verse 6, we've been taught those differences, so the choice is up to us. We, we can live lives that sow to our flesh and seek to please ourselves, or... We can live lives that so do the Spirit seek to please God. Sounds simple. Obvious choice. Until you're out there in life 
It's an obvious and easy choice to make when we're in here together in the church building. We're all loving on each other and hugging on each other and talking about the Lord and talking about one another and lifting each other up. But when we're out there and we're no longer with the flock, it's a lot different, isn't it? You see, everything in this world has been affected by the fall of man. All is tainted by sin. Now instead of one serpent in a perfect garden, we are surrounded by temptations everywhere we look in a fallen world. Maintaining consistent purity is hard. The moment we find victory in one area, we experience failure in another. This is, this is not so much about stopping one thing as it is maintaining another. What do I mean by that? Well, we'll never stop sowing to the flesh unless we purposefully sow to the Spirit. If we fail to read God's Word, take it to heart, meditate on it, and pray it back to God, we will walk in the flesh, period. Okay? I'm just going to cut it to the quick right here. If we cut ourselves off from God's Word, we cut ourselves off from God's presence, and as some have done, cut ourselves off from God's people, we will walk in the flesh. There's no way to avoid it because we make ourselves totally, completely vulnerable. We are supposed to be clothed in Christ and His righteousness, but that's something we have to continually do. We have to continually get up and put on that armor of God. And if we're not doing that, then we are fully exposed to anything Satan wants to throw our way. Christianity is, is not about the don'ts. It's about the do's. Don't let yourself be too focused on what you need to eliminate from your life because that's going to lead to failure and discouragement. You will feel frustrated with God all the time. I, mean, I know the scriptures say we're supposed to deny the flesh. The scripture is clear on that. But how can we do that if we don't rely on the Spirit? We cannot deny the flesh if we're not relying on the Spirit. He's the only way we can successfully overcome the temptations of our flesh. So Christianity is not about eliminating things. That's why a lot of people give an objection. Well, I can't, I can't go to church because uh, I can't do this and I can't do that and I can't do... Then you're not ready. Because Christianity is all about what you put on in order to get rid of other things. Not about what you take off in order to put on. Christ never said, get clean before you come to me. He said, come to me and I'll make you clean. And the same is true even after we've accepted Him as Lord and Savior. You want to be clean and walk rightly with God? Then walk with God. That's the answer. That's the simple answer. Walk with God. And you don't need me to keep telling you how to do that. You know how to do that. We have to focus on what we need to add to our lives that can crowd out the deeds of the flesh. Those are spiritual things. Hold, hold your place here and uh, go to... Um, 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. I got time to do this. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 through 10. We're going to go from Paul to Peter, and we're going to find, unlike this individual that shared stuff with me a few weeks ago, that Peter and Paul pretty well agreed with one another without having to have Mary. Did anybody get that? Did I just slide did I pull a Tim Hawkins and slide that by you so quick that you didn't even get that? Peter and Paul get along just fine even without Mary. Come on. Hello. All right. 2 Peter 1. Hopefully you've gotten there by now. As long as I'm taking to get to it myself. Uh, it was a joke. Yes, Claude. Thank you. I got inspired a little bit last night. Just a little. 2 Peter 1, 2 through 10. Peter writes, grace. Well, what have we been talking about through, from, from Paul for the last eight sermons? Grace and peace. We've talked about that. Be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. If you're a believer today, you have everything you need to walk in Christ. He's given it to you. How? Through the true knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and excellence. You have the true knowledge of God. You know God because He has given you His Spirit to see Him and know Him like you couldn't know Him before. Like the lost cannot know Him. 
Verse 4, for by these he's granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them, the promises, the things he's promised us, heaven, his blessings, his presence, by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. You're set free from sin. What has Paul been talking about? Freedom. Freedom. Now for this very reason also, I think what he's saying is now because you're free, Applying all diligence. All right, now let's just stop at that word right there. That's a word we don't like too much. Diligence. That means an effort. That means a hard effort. That doesn't mean we just kind of play at it. Doesn't mean, uh, well, every few days I'll pray, or every few days I might pick up the word. That means diligently recognizing that your spiritual well-being depends upon your diligence to spend time with God. To choose to make it a priority in one's life. And he says, applying all diligence in your faith. He's assuming faith because you're a believer. Supply moral excellence. All right, got a moral issue today in your life? How do you become excellent? How do you, how do you get to where you're morally upright and right? Well, diligence and faith. And in your moral excellence, knowledge. That means more knowledge. More knowledge of the Lord. You'll grow in your knowledge. Listen, the, the, the one thing that can shut off our growing knowledge of Christ is immorality. When we're walking in a moral way, then we will know God more. And in your knowledge, well, here we go back to the fruit of the Spirit. Self-control. Peter and Paul do agree, don't they? Here is the, the, the concept. What he's saying is, if we will be diligently walking in faith, looking to be morally right, we will grow in our knowledge and we will exhibit self-control. And once we exhibit self-control, he says in your self-control, perseverance. We'll persevere in the faith. And in your perseverance, godliness rather than worldliness. And in your godliness, if you're walking godly, look what happens. Brotherly kindness, another part of the fruit of the Spirit. And in your brotherly kindness, love. Wow. It's almost like they were reading each other. But God has a way of bringing things together, doesn't he? For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, well, the only way they can increase is if you stay in fellowship and stay in God's Word and stay in fellowship with God. They render you neither useless, and look at this word, nor unfruitful, in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You want to bear the fruit of the Spirit, these things have to be increasing. And as they increase, you will bear more and more fruit. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. But... The flip side of that is if we stop practicing those things, we will continually stumble. Now back to Galatians. All this is very serious stuff. It relates to our witness. Fleshly living is destructive to us in our relationships. Churches are divided by members walking in the flesh. Homes are divided by spouses or a spouse walking in the flesh. Life eternal is the benefit of sowing to the things of the Spirit. That's when the fruit of the Spirit comes out of us and others find Jesus. Our choice to walk in the flesh can seal the eternal destiny for someone who is apart from Christ. They see that witness, they may never come to Christ. As can our choice to walk in the Spirit and not carry out the desires of our flesh. That's when they are more likely to see the Lord and want to know Him. So be true to the gospel. Be a spiritual person, full of the spirit, spirit-minded and fruitful. That's what Paul's encouraging us to be. And let me add one more thing. It's hard to be spiritual, and I've said this already, and I'm not trying to really hurt anybody's feelings, but if this strikes a note, then so be it. It's hard to be spiritual when we're constantly letting ourselves be distracted. Distracted by what we watch, what we listen to, who we hang out with, where we hang out. When we let those things pull us away from spending time with God, we stop being spiritual. 
and I'm not saying you have to spend every single moment in God's word and every single moment of your life in prayer. I'm not saying that. But are we spending any? Can we not give up some of our entertainment and things like that to spend some time with God? We can't entertain our lives away. That's not walking spiritually. Third this morning, the true gospel leads us to care about others. Leads us to care about others. It's kind of similar to, to the first point, but a little broader. Look at verses 9 and 10. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially those who are the household of the faith. Again, we've already talked about uplifting fellow believers, so I'm not going to dwell on this too much, but this is general. It's much broader. It's not about just doing good works, but about being godly people. Caring about others with a genuine heart rather than a heart full of hypocrisy that says, I only care about them if I can get something out of them. This is not just talking about being godly towards others. It's really doing it. It's really doing it. And he says, especially to those who are of the household of the faith. Because nobody that's outside the household of the faith is going to believe we're genuine if we're not loving each other and taking care of each other and doing good to each other. And let me just say this right here. This is the strength of this church. All right? We need to build off of that. You want a vision today? Let me give you a vision of what this church can be. We have the foundation of love and fellowship with God and with each other for those who are regularly coming here. We got it. Are we going to build off of that? Are we going to use that to reach others to say, hey, we have a loving group of folks who really love the Lord. If you really want to know God and you really want to be close to God, there's a lot of churches out there, but I want to tell you there's not a lot of Bolivia Baptist churches out there. Use that. Build off of it. Help people see it. When you're having conversations with people, talk about it. Talk about the Lord, but talk about what God is doing and has done in our fellowship, it's a foundation that we need to build off of. Amen? All right, well, let me close this out. This is one of those Tim Hawkins close it out things because I got another bunch of verses here. But I'm going to walk through them very quickly here. Verse 11, I want to finish this out. Those are my main points today. But I, I want to finish it out and close this out because he writes, look at what he says in verse 11. See with what large letters I'm writing to you with my own hand. And when you see something like that, you can overlook that. But I want to tell you, you know what that says? How important this was to Paul. Remember back earlier, he was suffering from an eye problem? He's not letting somebody else write this for him. He's writing it himself. He's probably writing it with large letters, possibly because of his eye problem. <laughs> Maybe because it's like when we text somebody or whatever, we do everything in all caps, we're yelling. <laughs> he might be doing that. I don't know for sure. But he's saying, I'm writing it with large letters, my own hand. I want you to know this is important. And he says in verse 12, those who desire to make a good showing in the flesh, he's talking about the Judaizers, trying to compel you to be circumcised, simply that they will not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For those who are circumcised do not even keep the law themselves, but they desire to have you circumcised so that they may boast in your flesh. What he's saying is, remember, these Judaizers, the reason they're having you go and be circumcised is because they're afraid of being persecuted by the Jews. They're not thinking about you. They're thinking about themselves. So don't listen to them. Their motives are impure. They're not right. They're afraid. They want to look good to everybody. Don't associate with them, he says. Don't. And he says they want to be able to boast in your flesh, but look what Paul says in verse 14. Classic verse. But may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. He's like, I don't need to boast in your flesh. 
or my flesh, I boast in Christ's flesh crucified for me on the cross. My flesh may fail me, but my Lord will never fail me. He's saying, while they want to boast in you, I'm boasting in Jesus. Who are you going to follow? Who are you going to follow? And what does it mean if, we, if we're boasting in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ? If we're accepting Him by grace, does that mean we go live any way we want to? Do anything we want to? The deeds of the flesh are fair game to us because we're in Christ? No. He says, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. I'm not walking that way anymore. Not walking that way. Verse 15, for neither is circumcision anything nor in circumcision but a new creation. Circumcision was of the old ceremonial law. That has passed away. Jesus completed that on the cross. In Him we are a new creation. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Verse 16, and those who will walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. We have said this already in this series. What he is saying here is very kind of subtle. If you just lift this verse up, you don't get it out of the context of the whole book. But what he's saying is, if you are walking by the rule of grace, you will have peace and you will understand the mercy of God. But if you are trying to still do it by works, if you are still looking at the law to try to be saved, you will never have peace and never understand mercy. It just won't happen. And then he goes on to say, From now on, let no one cause trouble for me. <laughs> for I bear on my body the brand marks of Jesus. Now, why does he say that? Well, again, in contrast to the Judaizers who are trying to avoid persecution by taking people back to the works, Paul says, I've taken beatings because of grace. I believe it that strongly. It, the marks are on my body. I am not afraid of persecution. I believe that strongly in Jesus Christ. And he ends with this. The grace, an appropriate word to end this, for the last line of this, of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, which is the Holy Spirit within as well, brethren. Amen. I believe too often... We as believers try to be good church members in the flesh when we really need to be good Christians in the spirit. The difference is seen in how we think and live when we're not around believers. Did you hear what I said there? The difference is in how we think and live when we are not around believers. Because what will come out then is one of two things. Either the boldness of Paul to say, I don't care if I get laughed at. I don't care if I get persecuted. I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able and I'm going to work through this and I'm going to walk with Christ. Or we can be like the Judaizers. And when we're not with other believers, go along to get along and protect ourselves. When we're walking in the Spirit, we will choose to walk in the Spirit all the time, no matter what it costs us, because we have been saved by grace. It's a gift that we could not earn, and we should not forsake for the temporary pleasures of this life. Will we? Yes, because we still need grace every day. Should we? No. We are called to refuse the flesh and walk in the Spirit, to refuse to engage in works as a way of earning favor with God and to rest in His grace and favor through Christ. This series has been a defense of the true gospel of grace. So may our lives reveal that to one another and to others. May people in our lives see us as the most gracious, loving, kindest people in their lives, even more so than their families. May they see us as the people they really want to be close to so that we can bring them to the Lord 
that they need to be close to. Amen? Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for this series. We thank you for showing us the true gospel of grace. And it all comes down to our choice now to walk in it, to walk in the Spirit so that we won't carry out the desires of the flesh, to walk in the Spirit so that people can see you rather than see us, so that we can bear fruit that lasts, eternal kingdom fruit. Lord God, forgive us for the times we just kind of play church. The times that we just kind of put it on when we're here and then just kind of cruise through the rest of the week. Lord God, may we be restored today. May we be renewed today. May we surrender ourselves back to being spirit-minded and recognize that we are not our own. We have been bought with a price. Thank you for paying that price, Lord Jesus, for us because we didn't have what it took to do it. Thank you for saving us. Lord, teach us now to walk with you as people set apart for your own possession. And we pray this in Jesus' name.